The following is a presentation of Peoria Nazarene Church. We are a church that seeks to make, mature, and multiply followers of Jesus Christ among all people. For more information about Peoria Nazarene Church, visit peorianazarene.church. Again, I want to welcome you. Thank you for being here. Um, We are delighted to have you join us. We're going to... Um, uh, spend some time today looking at a very familiar story uh, to perhaps many. For some, it may be the first time you've heard uh, this story from the Gospel of John chapter 4. But it's a beautiful story of what it means and what it looks like to belong in God's family. If I were to ask you, how many of you like being surprised? Raise your hand. (laughs) That's kind of a misleading question, isn't it, a little bit? (laughs) It kind of depends on what the surprise is, right? So if that surprise is a gift, if it's something that you've been wanting, um, that's often received well. Uh, Sometimes maybe you've been surprised going to the grocery store, and you're there, and you see somebody you know. And how many of you love those encounters, and you can't wait to talk to somebody you know? Raise your hand. You know, it's shockingly, well, there's quite a few. How many of you will go out of your way to avoid having a conversation with somebody you know at the grocery store? Come on, be honest. I don't believe you. Because I'll be honest, even the most extroverted amongst us, you know, there's times when you're going to the grocery store, you just, I don't know why. There's people, there's nothing wrong with them. You just want to do your thing and leave. And that's true for many of us. In fact, when I started dating my wife, she was from a small town, Robinson, Illinois, and I remember going to the grocery store with her, and I found it so annoying that not only did she know everyone, everybody knew her. And I just, it made me feel so uncomfortable, and I'm an extroverted person, that I just was like, man, I can't wait to get back to Bloomington Normal where I grew up, that area. I can go to the grocery store, and I don't see a soul I know. Except for that one time, I don't normally wear sweatpants, but maybe that one time (laughs) that I think I can get away with sneaking to the grocery store, looking like I just rolled out of bed, that's the one time I see three or four people at the grocery store. You know how that goes, right? Sometimes we like being surprised, other times we don't, but this story is one of those moments that something unexpected happens. And at the time, the place, the situation, the person that seemed least likely to be able to offer hope is the very one, the very place, the very time where God comes to a woman who is in need of experiencing the love of God. Jesus welcomes us to belong with him, to trust in him, and to commit to follow him. Author uh, Dr. Brene Brown, who's also uh, a professor, a background in social work, accomplished author, she talks about belonging and she describes it this way. She says, belonging is the innate human desire to be a part of something larger than us. Because this yearning is so primal, we often try to acquire it by fitting in and seeking approval, which are not only hollow substitutes for belonging, but often they become barriers to it. Because true belonging only happens when we present our authentic, imperfect selves to the world, our sense of belonging can never be greater than our level of self-acceptance. This quote, she talks about how being vulnerable, being willing to be weak, being willing to be as we really are is the foundation for true belonging. Problem is, most of us have been burnt by that, right? (laughs) And we kind of grow and we learn to cover things up. We learn to wear a calloused front to protect ourselves from being hurt again. We tend to resist shame. We tend to withdraw from people. But here in the Gospel of John, we have a story of Jesus, the Son of God, the Word made flesh, encountering an individual who is lost in her shame, isolated, alone. And there's much we can learn about what it really means to belong by looking at this story. So I would invite you to follow along John chapter 4. You can listen along or follow along on the screen as well. John says, Now when Jesus learned the Pharisees had heard 
that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize only his disciples. He left Judea and he departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away in the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would ask him, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go and call your husband and come here. The woman answered to him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither here or in Jerusalem you will worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, There are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows, another reaps. 
I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that you welcomed us here. Friends, family, you've welcomed us here ultimately to be with you. Thank you for your Son, who is truly the Savior of the world. Thank you for the word of life. Thank you for Scripture, the Bible that points us to you, that helps us understand who you are, who we are, who you're calling us to be. We pray that as we reflect on your word today for a few moments, Lord, uh, help us in our hearts to not put up barriers and be willing to stand afar off, Lord, but help us to come to you to listen, to consider that the words that you gave this Samaritan woman are your words for us today. And that the same life, the same hope, the same love that so radically transformed her is available to us today. Whether we, have, whether we are far from you or whether we have known you and we have followed you, we need that same grace today. So we invite you through your spirit to speak to us, to guide us, and may we with not just our minds but with our hearts respond to you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This story is a very, very unexpected story. If you've ever read the Gospel of John, as you begin to read John's account, as he starts telling about Jesus, his life, and who he was, we're kind of okay with chapter 3, because there we find Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, who is a Jewish, highly esteemed religious leader. And we would expect that Jesus, who is a Jew, who is a leader, who uh, is coming as more than that, is ultimately the Savior of the world, we'd expect him to be in conversation with this highly esteemed individual in John 3. And in this conversation that Jesus has with this religious leader, we don't see a response from Nicodemus. Jesus challenges a lot of his understanding of what really it means to have eternal life, but Nicodemus does not ultimately respond in faith to Jesus. And then we turn to chapter 4, and Jesus has to go to Samaria. And it's there that he encounters this woman, who is a Samaritan woman. And in this day, Jesus crosses this incredible social, religious, and cultural divide. Jews and Samaritans did not associate together. There was hatred. There was hostility that, that was centuries in work. This divide was still alive during Jesus' day. Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Samaritans don't associate with Jews. And in a very unexpected way, Jesus has to go to Samaria. Now, when we study the, the world of the Bible here, and, and, and these are real places that we have evidence and archaeological evidence for, um, the fastest way to get where Jesus was going would be to go through Samaria. But it certainly was not the preferred route. In fact, uh, for Jewish individuals who are traveling, they would avoid and go around Samaria, this area, because they didn't want to interact with the despised Samaritans there. But Jesus has to go through Samaria. And, and, and individuals, commentators agree that this is something more than just a, a, a need to drive through this neighborhood. No, this is Jesus being compelled by God the Father to go because there is somebody who is hurting. There is somebody who is broken. 
there is somebody who is isolated in their shame, in their suffering, and they're alone, and they need the love of God the Father. So Jesus had to go to Samaria. It's important that we catch that. This isn't the normal way. This is showing us who God really is. Jesus, the Son of God, the Word made flesh, God himself become human, had to go because there was this seemingly forgotten, insignificant Samaritan woman that Jesus must go and give and share the love of God, to share the hope of God. A second observation we can make in this story is that as these, this conversation unfolds between the Samaritan woman and Jesus, at first, she does not recognize who, she, who she's speaking to. Right in front of her is the Creator God. Right in front of her is the Messiah, God's promised Savior to the world. And as she dialogues with him, she does not recognize who she is speaking with. She comes to this well alone at a time of day and in a fashion that was not common for women of this day. Very seldomly would they ever go to the well alone, but here intentionally she is avoiding people. She's withdrawn, she's hurting, and now she's coming alone precisely so that she might not encounter other people. But here comes the Savior of the world, Jesus of Nazareth himself, the Messiah, to speak with her. She's isolated. She's lost. There is no way that she could belong. There's seemingly no way with what's happened to her, with what's unfolded in her life, that she could ever again find the path to life, to hope, to freedom. This certainly is not the right time. It's not the right place. And having a Jewish man who she knows despises Samaritans, and especially a Samaritan woman, this certainly is not the right person who could bring her hope and healing. She doesn't recognize that right at what seems to be the wrong time, the wrong place, the wrong person, standing before her is the creator himself, And this isn't accidental. He doesn't happen upon this Samaritan woman. No, he had to go. Because there's someone hurting. There's someone lost. There's someone hiding who needs the love of God. This is who God is. As they begin to talk, uh, another observation we can make is that Jesus, in dialoguing with her, to even do that is... He communicates hospitality. He engages her. And and even before she she begins to talk about who she is and what's happened, as Jesus begins to to dig deeper into her past, already at the beginning, Jesus said, if you knew who was standing before you, you would ask and you would have that, that, that water, that living water in your heart that swells up to eternal life. You would have what you're looking for So even before her past comes into the conversation, here is God inviting and welcoming and communicating to her that she belongs. This is unheard of in this culture, unheard of. But Jesus won't let her hide. He won't let her cover or run from the shame of her past. He won't let her cover up the problems anymore. And instead, as he dialogues with her, he lovingly brings to light her area of shame, her hurt, what's at the very cause of her isolation, and he invites her to trust in him. He asks her to go and get her husband. He already knows. He already knows that she's had five He already knows that she's now with somebody who's not one of those fives. He already knows she's hurting, she's lost, she's separated. There's pain in her heart. And Jesus listens. He listens to her. And he shows her that in the least expected place, the least expected time from the least expected person, when she feels alone and isolated and she could never belong again, God is there. 
and he loves her. Invites her to trust in him. Her response as a Samaritan woman uh, is to automatically point out the differences in religion. You know, wait a minute, time out here. Samaritans worship on Mount Gerizim, whereas Jews worship in Jerusalem. So what place do I need to go? There's a problem here. You being a Jewish person, me being a Samaritan, what do I do? Where should I go to worship God? And Jesus digs a little deeper. He identifies that God is doing something new. That with his coming, with the coming of God's Savior, with the Lord Jesus Christ here, the time has come where God will dwell in the hearts of all men and women of all backgrounds, no matter what the past, no matter who we are, no matter what we have or don't have, all people who place their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ, God himself comes to dwell in his church, the people of God. So he says that the time has come. It's not here. It's not there. God is looking for people wherever we are who in our hearts who in our hearts when God encounters us in those moments we don't expect him, when he comes to us in our areas of shame, behind the wall that we put up to protect ourselves, he desires for men and women, boys and girls, to respond to him and his invitation to belong, to receive him and his grace, to trust in him as Lord and Savior. Jesus says that is true worship. God desires more than religion. He desires a genuine relationship with us. He created us to know him. He created us to love him. Just like the Samaritan woman, our sins, our self-centeredness, our rebellion against him have made that impossible because he's a holy, loving God. But God has come to us in the form of Jesus the Messiah, the Savior of the world, standing right before this woman in her brokenness and in her isolation is the Lord himself. And he comes to invite her to trust in him, to love him, to believe in him, to know what it truly means to have living water, eternal life. The fifth observation is this. When the woman finds out that Jesus is the Messiah, how does she respond? She trusts in him. And I want to draw this distinction. Chapter 3, Nicodemus, the highly esteemed studier of the scriptures, the very religious man, esteemed in his culture, a leader, when he encounters Jesus, we don't see in chapter 3, trust. He stands afar off. Here is this woman who's forgotten by society, who's withdrawn, who is despised. When the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, the savior of the world, Jesus Christ, comes to her, when he meets her beyond the wall of her own shame, she fully trusts in him. She trusts in him as the savior of the world, but also as the Lord, the Lord God. And she doesn't just do that in an impersonal, disconnected sense. No, in the middle of her life, her brokenness, Her problems, she personally trusts in him. And the response is pretty amazing. She goes back. Here's the woman who was hiding. Here's the woman who was alone, avoiding people. She runs back. She tells everybody, you've got to see. I believe I've encountered the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He knew about me. Hear this. He knew about me And he loved me. Not only am I fully known, I'm fully loved. Come and see. And you know as the Samaritans come out and they they go, can this woman, really the woman that we all know and probably have been talking about, could it really be true? So they run and they go see Jesus. In two days, Jesus stays there. Two days. You see, he had to go to Samaria. He had to go. And many, many believe because of Jesus and because of the testimony of the Samaritan. There's so much more that we could talk about from this story. But before we go, I just want to talk a little bit about what 
what does this mean for you and I? You know, here's some observations that we've already looked at, but what might this mean for you and I? And I think the first inescapable truth that we have to see here is this, and that is that Jesus knows about your hurts and about my hurts. Jesus fully knows. He knew about this seemingly insignificant individual. He knew about her story. He knew about her shame. She was fully known before she ever said a word. What everyone else couldn't see that she was hiding, the walls she was putting up, God was there. His loving presence, he was there. And do you realize this morning that God fully knows you? There's nothing he doesn't know about you. And do you realize that in the same way he meets this woman in her shame, the loving, holy presence of God, he fully loves you today. You are fully known the good and the bad, the light and the dark, what's public, what's private, it is all known. And you are fully loved by God. I think the second truth that what this might mean for us is that we often don't recognize, we often don't recognize Jesus when he comes to us. Especially when we encounter difficult times, especially when we feel lost and we feel alone and we feel trapped and we feel isolated. It's precisely those moments that we feel that God couldn't be any farther away from us than possible. But this story reminds us that it's actually precisely in those moments where we are forgotten by others, where we are alone in our shame and we are lost. It's precisely those moments that God is nearest to us. Amen. But we don't see it. We don't recognize it. And I think if you think about that, you can, you can identify with that. But then you know there's also those moments that in the hurt, in the lostness, it's like out of nowhere, somebody shows up at your door. Somebody calls you. Somebody texts you. Somebody in the church family, somebody extends the grace of God. It could be the beauty of creation just hits you. In a dark time, you step outside and you see the wonders of God's creation and you know that you're not alone, that he's with you. Sometimes it's through his Holy Spirit in us that gives us a strength in those moments that we don't understand or have in and of ourself. The third truth that I believe God has for us personally today is this. Jesus wants to meet us in our darkest places. He loves me enough. He loves you enough to not allow me to pretend anymore. To hide, to avoid, to cover. He wants the real you. He wants the real me. How many times in our social interactions, and it's true, We'd probably never come to church again if we all showed each other the real us, you know, how we're feeling. If we all said that everything that came into our mind, we just spoke it. We'd be shocked at some of the things that we don't know that are going behind the surface. But do you realize that God knows he loves you? He wants the real you. It's not the fake you that he loves or the, the you that you dress up. It's the real you he loves. The story, we cannot escape that truth. There's no way we can get, get around that this is a shameful story. I mean, it becomes one of the most loved stories of the church. But otherwise, this is a story that I wouldn't want people writing a book about me in initially, would you? I mean, this is not something, but her place of shame becomes the place of God's glory. Because God meets her there. And it's important that we see that it's there that God meets us if we'll let him, if we'll believe that it's true. And no matter how messed up or how sinful or how hurt we are, there is a God that loves us, and his love and his grace is so much greater than any hurt that's been done to us, than any, anything that we've held behind. That's how much he loves us. Jesus wants to live within us. And we can't escape in this story 
that our part, just like the Samaritan woman, is to allow him to meet us right there, to experience his love and grace that comes to us in unexpected times and places. Our part is when that happens, fully trust in him. Don't hold anything back. Fully trust in him and believe that Jesus is Savior and Lord. And receive him as such. Commit to follow him all the days of your life. Commit to walk with him. And then share. Share out of that hurt with others. When, we, when you find a right answer... We usually like to share it, don't we? Um, there's so many YouTube videos of people, and some of them are great. Some of them are flat out terrible, aren't they? Of somebody sharing like, hey, you want to change your brakes? Here's how you change them. A lot of them are really good. You can get in trouble too. There's, there's a YouTube video for everything. In fact, uh, the days of going and asking your neighbor how to do something are, are kind of gone, which is kind of sad in a sense, but we just go to YouTube. And I think there's something in human nature that when you find an answer, you want to share it. You want to pass that along. And, and in this life of the Samaritan woman, there's the reality of she has found that living water. She has found that selfless, unconditional love that she couldn't find in any person or any other place. She's found it in God. And so she wants to share. She has to share. And I just want to speak to you, especially those who are following Jesus and to our church Jesus had to go to Samaria. Where do you have to go? I think it's important that we hear that. When we go to Walmart, see somebody we know, we kind of quickly go the other way, we withdraw, we, our tendency might be to disconnect. Maybe we avoid certain people. It's a lot easier to avoid hurting people than to offer help. It's a lot easier to... Stay away and pray. Sometimes that's good. But so many times, when we look at the example of Jesus, followers of Christ, where is it that God is calling us to go? We have to go. Is there somebody hurting who's alone, who's isolated? Is there a place that's forgotten? Jesus had to go. Into that difficulty, his, di- his disciples misunderstood him. They criticized him. The religious leaders talked about him for talking to a Samaritan woman, but he had to go because somebody was hurting. Somebody needed his love. Somebody needed hope. Where is Jesus calling you and me to go? Is there a person? Is there a place? To go and to first let people know they can belong, that they're loved that they're loved, that they're not alone, to listen, to be the presence of Jesus, to cry with, to care for. Jesus welcomes us to belong with him, to trust in him, and to commit to follow him. As we close today, we're going to take time as a church family, and we're going to pray for somebody who's asked to be prayed for today. And I know if you're a guest here today, Um, This may be new to you, especially if you're a guest from another church or background, but um, at Pure Nazarene, we are committed to connecting people to God's love and God's family. And so we as a church family often will celebrate the good news when it happens, but we also, when somebody's facing difficulty, we surround them as a church family and we pray for them. So if you're a guest, uh, we're not asking you to do anything right now, Um, but uh, Dory Borop, who's a part of our church family, Uh, shared with me this week. Um, We've known, we've been praying, um, but this week she's she's, she's had cancer for some time. It's come back. This isn't the first time, Um, but she shared and wanted me to share with you that she has a surgery this week, a mastectomy. Um, There's concern about cancer being in the lymph nodes, and uh, so we as a church family, we, we, we do these things as a family, and uh, in fact, Dory mentioned to me, she said, hey, um, I really would love the church family to pray for me, but it's Friends and Family Sunday. Won't that make guests uncomfortable? And I'm concerned about that. Is that the right time? And I said, Dory, this is who we are. This is the church of Jesus Christ. You know, and we surround each other. We pray for each other. I'll I'll never forget, and I shared it with you. Uh, We prayed for uh, Trish Lusher, 
um, and who's here with us today. And we surrounded her right here. And I looked over and I saw Dory Borop kneeling down and embracing Trisha Slusher with the love of Jesus Christ, knowing that she has cancer in her body too. And so we pray and we surround. And if you're a guest today, one of the things we do in the Church of the Nazarene is to symbolize that God is with us when things are great. But guess what? He's also with us when things are not. And one of the ways we symbolize that is by doing what what Scripture tells us in James 1, that if anyone is sick, we come together and we anoint them with oil. And we believe and we pray the prayer of faith. And the oil is not magical. If you've seen something on TV that indicates otherwise, that's not us. There's nothing magical in the oil. It's just a symbol. It represents the healing and the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we as a church family surround and we pray for one. And uh, so we're going to do that uh, here today. And uh, so I'm going to invite Dory to come over here. And uh, Jeff, if you want to come with her, uh, Ashley, anyone else in the family.